So at this point, um, I'm going to, I would like to introduce Dr. Christine Drennan. Um, I'm very excited that she's with us here this morning. And um, here she is, Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology, Director of Urban Studies at Trinity University. And how many of you came just because of Christine? Yeah, yeah, I looked at, yeah, somebody in the back. Yeah, me too, me too. But I'm gonna read what's on her um, little web bio from Trinity, because I love this part. Christine Drennan, as quickly as she could, joined the Trinity faculty in 2002. So she made it to San Antonio as quickly as she could, and within months became engaged in addressing San Antonio's challenges. An associate professor of sociology and anthropology with expertise in urban geography and community development. Drennan seeks to give her students and all of the rest of us San Antonians an intense appreciation for where they come from, both historically and geographically, and help them engage in their individual communities. And she says, once they leave Trinity, but in our communities today. Her students often work alongside her in urban research projects throughout the city. Um, I can't say enough about Christine and what she has done for San Antonio. I wish there was a way to map that and all of the presentations that you've done along the way and all the domino effects and impact that it's had. So um, I wanna invite you forward, but I wanna invite you forward in gratitude and in thanks. So if we can applause at the applaud at the beginning for the work she's already done. Thanks, Anne, and whoa. I'm a walker. I have the nervous energy when I speak, so I'm just going to be all over the place. Um, good morning, and thank you for having me and for having Molly. And um, and I, this it, this could be a really really fun morning. Um, let's get off the picture. The picture makes me nervous. Um, but this is what this is what I speak about is um, is all the economic segregation in the city. Uh, and as a geographer, I've been trained as a geographer, the question is always, well, yes, you know, we see all these statistics, and let me show you those, show you those statistics. Um, in the last couple of years, and you've probably seen this, you know, just in the newspaper on the, on, on the radio, is that several think tanks around the country have identified San Antonio as one of the most economically segregated cities in the country, right? So we've got the Economic Innovation Group, they're out of DC 2016, and they keep repeating this study every year, so the findings are the same. Is that spatial inequality scores run from a low in this little tiny town in, in Arizona to a high of that number, we don't know what that number means, but in San Antonio, Texas, right? So they're running just big data sets and have determined that we are, we are amongst the top five, I would say, of the economically segregated cities in the country. Other think tanks have followed along trying to redo a lot of that research and try to understand some of these dynamics. The San Antonio Express News picks that up, as they should, and they, and they write, if you're born into a more prosperous part of the San Antonio community, you have a significantly better chance at achieving professionally and educationally. If you are grown up in a, one of our more distressed neighborhoods, you're almost destined for a life in poverty. And, this, and, and, and these are intergenerational questions that we're looking at. And so the question has really got to be, why, why, why has this happened? How has this happened? They go on and they write, for the past 50 years, 78207, District 5, has been defined by poverty, inequality, and a sheer lack of opportunity. 50 years, technically, it's three or four generations, right? So these areas are stuck and they're not getting better. And we need to understand in order to figure this out and to do anything about it, I deeply, deeply feel that we need to understand how we got there in order to fix it. Um, just some vocabulary, right? Just so that everywhere all clear where we are. We're not the poorest city in the country. Actually, that's McAllen. We're number 26. We're not the most unequal. That's actually Miami. We're number 54. But we're the most, we're the most segregated, which means that there's a spatial component to our inequality. So if you make a, a, a whole bunch of money and I just make a little tiny bit of money, I live way over here 
than you live over there. And that's got tremendous implications because a lot of the services that we receive, we receive through where we live. They're, they're spatially distributed. Our libraries, our school, our healthcare, our food is all, most of those things come to us from where we live. So our spatial segregation, right, this thing that, that you know, where we're number one top of the list actually matters quite a bit. Um, just this is just, just a picture of it. Just and just this is a, my first warning is that I'm a geographer by training, but also kind of I think was born that way. I map everything, so you're going to see you're going to see so many maps. You're not going to you, you just you can't even look at them anymore. Um, but that's how I make sense of the world. So this you know so you're looking at Bear County here, and and color even if you can't read the key, I just use color to to signify qu quantities. So darker colors, more color, higher quantities. And in this case, just income, right? If our average income in the city of San Antonio is about $54,000, um, the lighter colors mean that's mean we're, we're way below that. The darker colors means we're way above. And in the middle, that's right, right, around, right around the 54s. But as you can see, we have a lot of really light color, and we have a lot of really dark color, but we don't have a lot of middle. And that's the concern here. And they're not interspersed, right? If the lights and the darks were interspersed, then the, then the kids would be going to school together, we would be grocery shopping together, we would be going to the same clinics together, but we don't, right? Because we're, they're not interspersed, they're spatialized. Um, that, this one is just, this is like me being fancy with maps. This, and all this shows is that in the blue areas, those are areas that are significantly above the mean and the brown are significantly below. So just trying to get a handle on this, this idea of segregation, right? So, so what? So what? So yes, lots of people in Washington, D.C. have given us a statistic. We've turned around. We've repeated it in the newspaper. We have lots and lots. We're like, there's like lots of conversations about this, but we're trying to figure out like, okay, the first question is, so what, right? I'm, you know, I'm middle class. I have a job. I have a benefits package. I'm almost six feet tall. I'm white, right? So what? I'm, you know, I'm doing fine. And that's a really honest, honest statement. I'm fine. Does this impact me other than ethically? And I'm not going to go through all of that for you because I think you know that. You feel that. You work that. That, that is your message. But for sometimes when I speak about this, I do go through the whole litany in all of the literature that says, yeah, so what? This is really important. It impacts our economic development. It impacts our, uh, as a community, it impacts our economic development, which means it impacts our incomes. It in, impacts our, the whole idea of social mobility in San Antonio, meaning can, will my kids grow up to do and be as successful as I? It impacts our crime rates. It impacts our social cohesion. It impacts our tolerance. And our idea, idea of social tolerance, which we know in the entire United States is threatened right now, is that we don't understand one another anymore. We don't, when we see a young person who dresses differently and has a different speech pattern, we're afraid because we're not, we're not around it enough. And this is why our segregation does matter. But again, I'm not going to go on into that as much because I think you get that. But what I am going to go into is, OK, we've been labeled this. We know it matters. How did this happen? Right? That's my question. How did it happen? And there are lots and lots of ideas about that. You open the newspaper, you listen to the radio every day, you will hear all of these different ideas. One of them, we like to live with our own kind. You hear that? But there's racism, classism, exploitation, corruption, deindustrialization. The biggest one right now out there, really, I think, in the public sphere is individual choice. Is, it's, is that a lot of people make good decisions and some people make bad decisions, and that puts them in certain categories with certain you know, levels of opportunity. Right? All of these, the reason I even bring that up is because if we do the research and we gather the, get, gather the information and the data and really do a, a really nice analysis of it, any one of those leads to different policy implications. Right? If we're going to try to create policy and move against this, Every single one of those would put us in a different place. So, and I'm not going to present on those. I'm going to present a different argument right now. And my argument has got to do with, oh, with property. Because everything in the United States has to do with property. 
the, the, the right that is protected in the Constitution was the right to own property. It was not civil rights. Civil rights were added in the 1960s. It wasn't even, it wasn't even the right to the franchise. That's only been expanded gradually through the years. It was the right to property, and it is still the most protected right that we have. Right? I cherish my own property. But it's, it's this that is it's this, and I, hopefully over the next oh, couple hundred slides, I will also convince you that that's where we are. So here we go, right? And this is what I'm. This is this is what I'm going to show. What I want to show you is that we have built a landscape from the bottom up, right? So we've created a landscape in the early 20th century, a landscape of neighborhoods, right? And we cherish our neighborhoods. We're we, we're proud of the fact that we are a city of neighborhoods. And then we continued through the mid 20th century. We invested in that landscape. Then we institutionalized it, and I'll show you what I mean. And right now, in the early 21st century, we're in the process of reinvesting. But every time we do, we go through one of those phases, we don't undo the old stuff, right? So from year to year, and this is exaggerating because I don't, but fashion changes, right? And, and some of us, um, probably not us, but people, like will give their whole wardrobe over to the Goodwill, and they'll go out and buy new clothes, right? Because fashion changed. We don't do that with the landscape. We don't do that with housing. We don't do that with property. Just because with times have changed, we don't go back in and reconfigure our neighborhoods. They're still there. So all of these years of policy, they pile up. And that's what I want to show you right now. So phase one, part one, creation, right? We're going way back, creation. Really old map. Can't see it well because of the lighting. Um, but old, really old map of Bear County. And if you, if you look at it really carefully, you can see the old six by six mile square, right, which was the old, the old original city boundaries centered on the cathedral, six by six mile square. And in there, and if the lights weren't so bright, I don't know if they can do anything about that. Um, you'd see that even the street pattern's going in. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And then on the, on the outsides in the county land, it's those huge, big strips of property. Oh, yay. Big strips of property that um, that's old ranch land that's been subdivided, right? So it, so that's very very rural. So I'm actually going to zoom right in into the inner city because that's where this story begins. <coughs> Another old map just to the inner, inner city. That's that's the old six by six mile square, right? Just and those are the streets you and I recognize. It doesn't have the highways in it yet because it's old. But there they are, right? So our streets, our street pattern, our grid pattern's old. And these, the red boxes, our neighborhoods. And this is, again, early 20th century. And what a friend of mine and I do is, <laughs> is and don't catch us on a boring day, but when, what we do, and we love this, is that we go, to the, we go to the county courthouse and we look up the old deeds of when the, old, when the neighborhoods were originally platted. And it's a very similar process to today. A developer buys a piece of land, old ranch land, agricultural land. They go to the county and they said, I'm going to subdivide this land, right? They get all the permits. They follow the regulations. They put in a subdivision. Fabulous. Same process. Now it's digitized, then it wasn't. But the, and so these red boxes are all the neighborhoods that we have found in the old historic documents that we can trace their origins, right? So it's like, it's, it's these kind, and, and the, um, the marketing around these was the same as today, right? You go and you go to the edge of town and you see the big billboards that say KB Homes, right? Marketing for new developments, it's the same. So this is BG Irish subdivisions in San Antonio, and this gentleman is, is building all of these subdivisions, and he was incredibly prolific in his building. Um, but so, so I want to look at these, all right? I want to look at these neighborhoods. I want to, uh, and I'm, we're going to, I'm going to just take you in and look at some of them and look at when they were developed and how they were developed, right? Here we go. North, south, east, and west. North. Beacon Hill. Uh, a neighborhood that's well represented over here. District 1, great, fabulous old neighborhood, right? Before, this is before 10. I don't have a pointer, but Beacon Hill is up in the northwest part of the old city, right? Um, there it is today, just, you know, just to make the point that, you know, that uh, the other map was really old, but this is new, still there, still the same houses, right? There's the housing stock in Beacon Hill. Fantastic. We love this. Appreciating 
um, there's a new there's there's a new appreciation for this kind of housing stock, so prices values are going way up. Right? This is the deed, and I'm not going to be able to read it either, but I'm going to try. This is the deed to the house. Every house has got a deed, right? You probably have your deed in your in your file cabinet somewhere. And it's what it says is there's a lot of legal language in there as far as where exactly this property is located in in, le in the, the legal addresses. And then it says how much these houses can be worth as this neighborhood is built, because they're trying to put, build some uniformity into these neighborhoods. Um, so these were $1,500. The houses back in the 1920s in Beacon Hill had to be worth at least $1,500. Um, it's often about setbacks, right? There's no tents. Right? There are no trailers. You can't live in the backyard. Um, and, then, and then finally it says, and again, I don't hear, oh, nobody with tuberculosis, but also nobody with nobody of Negro or Mexican descent may ever live in this neighborhood. Right? Going back. North Haven, another neighborhood right near Beacon Hill. North Haven is again in that northwest quadrant of the old city. This is the housing. It's a little bit smaller, but again, it's a housing that we tr cherish today. It's pretty unique. And again, in North Haven, all of these deed restrictions. And then in, 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 in North Haven, this one I can read. No, let's see, da, 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 da. any sale or lease of this property or, or properties thereof to any Mexican or any person of Negro blood should immediately cause this house to revert to the grantor, right? So these houses were, these, these neighborhoods were heavily restricted for who could live there. That's north, let's go south, south, right? I'm gonna go south to Harlandale. Harlandale, fabulous old neighborhood, right? Um, a working class neighborhood today, there it is going in, that's the original plat, the original plats are beautiful, they're all hand drawn. Um, and there's all the, new, all the houses going in. There they are today. There's been some urban renewal, so there's some newer stuff down there also. But in Harlandale, same thing. Here's, all the, here's the lease, and it says right here. There it is, right there. Right? No, part of this, uh, no part of this property shall ever be sold, leased, or rented to Negroes or Mexicans. Let's see. Let's go east, right? East. I'm going to go to the east side of downtown. There it is, Dignity Hill, one of our most coveted neighborhoods today, right? There it is today. I'll plan it out. Some of the housing stock, fantastically beautiful, right? It would have, was allowed to deteriorate, but in 1940, it also was deed restricted. This is the this is some data from the 1940 census. 1940 census allows me to go house by house to figure out who lived there, right? And so then that's exactly what I've done in here. And I've coded it. The blue is African American. The red is Mexican American. The brown, the light brown is, is Anglo American. New Braunfels Avenue, you can see that right there, was the dividing line between a, a heavily restricted Dignity Hill and a non-restricted neighborhood just to the east. And the, and the point of this is see, to see how well these things were working. They really were sorting us. They're sorting us out racially, right, by, by who can live where. All right, that's east. Let's go west. West is Prospect Hill, a classic neighborhood on the west side. It's a little bit further west. Again, no pointer. Great old housing stock, right? And the th same thing, same thing even on the west side in Prospect Hill, right? And this one, this one says no house less than $1,000 and a lot of the same housing restriction. So my point on that, north, south, east, west, is these neighborhoods were going in in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. They're heavily deed restricted. So my question then, right? Shoot, I wish I had a player. What's going on in here? What's going on in the middle, right? So I showed you north, south, east, and west as these new neighborhoods were going in. But my question is, what's going on in the middle then, right? Because that, that land, that, that middle stuff, you see it without the red boxes? What's going on in there was my question. So here they are, right? Here's some of those areas along the creeks and things. And I'll get back to that in a second. Little, these, and these, these also have a history. They're different though. They're smaller, smaller little developments, right? Not of the scale that I saw in the other ones. They're, they, like this was an entire development, one block. These deeds, no restrictions. No sign of any restrictions whatsoever, right? These neighborhoods developed by a different developer on a different scale were not restricted, 
right? This is what they look like today, right? A very different kind of infrastructure, different private infrastructure, different public infrastructure. The houses are smaller because the, lo the plots were smaller. When they were originally planted, subdivided, the plots were smaller. Then the streets were smaller and there wasn't the room for infrastructure, right? So there's no sidewalks. There's no space for a sidewalk, right? The street lighting is just like hanging out in the street. The street doesn't have any drainage. This is some of our real inner city neighborhoods and these were not restricted. So what, what we're doing is we actually end up funneling a lot of our population. The non-white population is funneled into these neighborhoods. Again, that 1940 census, and this is fun, the 1940 census for these areas says that who's living here, and I'm trying to code it, is African American, Mexican American, Chinese, English, Italian, people from Louisiana and Oklahoma, and some Russians, right? So that's, who, that's who's ending up in these real inner city west side neighborhoods, right? There's no, yeah, yes, the, 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 the Oklahomans in Louisiana might have been, may have been Anglo, but they were still, still pushed into some of our, our, our deeply inner city neighborhoods. Same thing, right? Just to make the point, just to show you that these old records, all of these little developments were much at various different scale. And, and when we look at it, there we go again, look at those, those pieces of property. Right, this is a different, the different thing that's going on here. And there's the street, right? And that is a street. It's not an alley. That's a street on the west side. District, district one or district five, I'm not sure. But again, you know, if we look at the housing stock, if we look at the public infrastructure, that we're looking at something very, very different. Right, there's the housing. Right, Gardendale. This is just. I think this might be my last example because this is this one's a, a, a very important to remember. There's your housing again, housing that sits just about on the street. We know the drainage patterns in this area. When that street starts to flood, it's going in that house, right? Um, so so, so in, during this time frame, as those neighborhoods, I was showing you, as those neighborhoods develop, they're deed restricted, which pushed our non-white population. And we've always had a significant non-white population. Today, we are majority, minority majority. I don't ever remember the order of the words. Um, but even, even back here, we had a significant non-white population and they are pushed into some parts of the city. The other parts, aren't, they're, not, they're, not, they're not welcome, right? Um, th and this is really, if you can see this, I'm not sure if you can because of the room. But really what I want to show you is that to the north, this is some area on the west side, and maybe for those that are close, to the north is, the, is an area that was heavily deed restricted, right? To the south of that street, that was where this restriction stopped. The south of that street was not restricted, deed restricted. This is today, right? Can you see the difference? Somebody close, can you see the difference between the north and the south of that street? Words. Give me a word. Yes. Cramped. Yes. But, the, but even if we look at the houses, they're cramped. It's dense. It's a little bit chaotic. Because what you got going on in these areas is people would go in and subdivide their own property. Like, oh, my, my son turned 18, he got married, I'm gonna subdivide my property and build another house for him. Fabulous, right? But, and then they, and then they patch in, they patched into the utilities, right? And SAWS and CPS still finds this stuff underground, right? But that's what was going on for generations in this part of town. 1948, that's declared unconstitutional, right? Nine, um, by Shelley versus Kramer. They say, no, 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 no more of that stuff, right? But by now, we're in phase two, right? Investment, right? And now, we're, now that stuff that I was just telling you, that was a relationship between you and your developer and you and your neighbors. By the 1930s, the federal government's taken off and they're getting involved in this stuff. And a lot of this was about pulling us out of the Great Depression. Banks wouldn't lend a penny to anybody. The building trades were stuck and stopped. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt wants to get the building trades going again and he needs the banks to start lending. He's also got veterans, veterans just pouring back in and there's nothing to live in, right? And that's gonna be, that's gonna be unrest. So he says, banks, banks, please start lending. Banks say, no, we're not gonna do it. And he said, okay, what, what about, here's a deal for you, right? If I guarantee, if I, the United States government, guarantee your mortgage, guarantee a mortgage if somebody forecloses on you, Will you start lending again? And banks said, eh, we will if it's not that risky, 
right? We, we get that, we love that, right? That's an FHA mortgage today, mortgage insurance, right? But what about, but, but, they, but, but, the, but the bank said, but tell us where. And, and the federal government goes, fine, we'll tell you where. We will go to the neighborhoods and we will go. And this is when the suburbs were built and there they are, they're pretty. But we'll go into every city in the country, right? And they use lo local appraisers to do this. And they, will, they looked at the housing and they looked at the people living in the housing. And if the housing was of a, of a good quality and the people living in the housing were white, it was coated green. That was the signal to the, United, to, to the United States government and to the banks that this was a safe investment, right? Go, lend money, invest in this neighborhood, mortgages, rehabs, whatever. There's the housing. Right in some of Monte Vista, um, uh, some of the housing up around Woodlawn is is was coated green. If a neighborhood had a, had a good housing stock, but it had some room for infill, right? And I'll show you what I mean. But it was still a white demographic. They coated it blue. It was still deemed a, a healthy a, a healthy risk, right? You could still loan in that area. You're probably going to get paid back, right? And this these are our Beacon Hills. Right, so there's the housing stock. Again, it's a housing stock that we really cherish today. There was also some infill, the little, little, little houses that got tucked into those neighborhoods that, that were considered infill. They've aged really well, right? And so these were our blue neighborhoods. If a neighborhood had housing stock that was beginning to deteriorate and there might have been a very slight non-white presence on the edge, the neighborhood was coated yellow. Right? And that, again, was a signal to the banks, now we're getting into some risk, right? And so here are our yellow neighborhoods. There's the housing, right? Still a housing that, 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 that we appreciate, but the banks were like, nah, you know, this is, this, these aren't safe. And then, finally, if a housing stock was, was in, in the process of deterioration, which housing does without investment, and this is a non-white population, it would, the neighborhoods were coded red. They were redlined by the federal government. And that was a signal to the banks that these are risky investments. Maybe you don't want to go there, right? And so, so, and we know what this housing stock looks like because these are the housing that I was talking about just a minute ago that was built Back when, back when there were no deed restrictions in these areas. Now, some really nice, significant housing gets caught up in this because it's close by. Right, so we got, and this is a, a house in, in uh, Prospect Hill. Putting all that stuff together so far, all those, those neighborhoods that I told you that were deed restricted originally, they were restricted against anybody non-white, they were open for a white population, they are, they're blue and green. Right, they're, so they're they're then deemed by the federal government safe investments, and I'll and I'll show you in a little bit how much money starts to flow into them. Those areas that were not restricted at the beginning, that were available for non-whites, they're coded yellow and red. Right, so we've got a couple of things going on. We're developing a very racialized landscape, but we're also denying all all of those neighborhoods any kind of investment whatsoever. Right, so not only are we are we segregating spatially, uh, segregating by race, we're also segregating now by class, and we're making that in the process. In the meantime, as we're doing all of that, if that's not enough, we start to grow. Right, there's the original city limits. There's by 1940. There's by 1950. There's by 1960. New development was what was was not risky, right? So it was green lined, but most of that new development was not available for a non-white population, right? So we're growing and th and those and those neighborhoods do get this kind of investment, but again, they're highly racialized. That stuff, that stuff also is over. 1968, President Johnson removes all of that racist language from federal housing policies through the first federal, um, the, the, his, his Fair Housing Act, part of the Civil Rights Bundle, right, that he passes in the 1960s. Um, but now I want to talk, so, so that's, these are these layers that I'm talking about, right? That layer three, institutionalization. So, I said on top of that once, now I'm going to say it again. On top of all of that, we begin to form the school districts, right? Now, if you can see this, and I'm not sure if everybody can, 
But we complained daily about how many school districts we had. Until 1950, we had over 60. So that's got lines in it. I don't know if you can see them. Um, but we had over 60 school districts. They were mostly rural. These were the CSDs, the common school districts. They reported to the county. So the county would meet as the county commissioners. They would end that meeting. Then they would, and then they would reconvene immediately as the school commissioners. Right? And they would make the decisions about the CSDs. San Antonio School District was always an ISD that was state law as a municipality. They were an independent school district, meaning they could raise taxes, and they had their own board of trustees, right? Um, really, 1920s, 1930s, East Coast movement to start to consolidate this. We're an industrializing country. We need kids who are literate in math and, you know, no, I don't know what the equivalent for math is, but math people. Um, and and so they needed to go to school all day. They needed to go to school all year. They needed teachers who were professionals. They needed administrators who were professionals. Right? Let's get it out from, uh, from underneath the, the po political process. So school districts start to consolidate in, in, the, in, you know, in order to be efficient, in order to be more professional. This is an interesting process. Right? So let me see. There they are. There's a better, there's a better map. There's the red lines on top of this, because I want you to watch this process. Let me go to that. So the big school districts, right, like the north sides, the northeast, right, our big successful school districts to the north side, the little school districts within there literally started making phone calls to one another. This was an easy process. They made phone calls and they said, do you want to consolidate? And so some of those, like there's one of them up there called Lock Hill Selma District. There's like all names that you would recognize. And they said, well, they said, you know, tell, tell us what you're worth, how many kids you got, how much property tax can you raise, Tell us what you're worth, and then they decided it was a financial it was a financial decision, right? And so, all, so our big districts form out of that process, right? And they're very diverse, and and um, and they're actually quite successful, north side, northeast, right? And even east central over here to the east, and some of the south side. But look, notice in the inner city, San Antonio San Antonio school district. And this is why it's so oddly shaped, right? The one right in the middle. They consolidate with three. They consolidate with Los Angeles Heights School District, W.W. W. White, and Hot Wells. And that's why San Antonio is so oddly shaped. But notice this one. Can I do it? See the one just west of San Antonio? What is it? Edgewood. Edgewood. Edgewood's famous. So Edgewood also makes the phone call. They make the phone call to Northside, and they say, do you want to consolidate? And Northside well, says, well, what are you worth? How many kids you got? What are you worth? What's your property taxes? How much can you raise? And Northside says, no. No, thank you. And then they, they call San Antonio School District. And, they say, and San Antonio School District says basically the same. Show us your balance sheet. What are you worth? And San Antonio never calls back. And this is in the school board minutes. So Edgewood has to decide. They decide we're going to go. At a, we're going to go it alone. We can't. We nobody will consolidate with us. So we're going to become an independent school district of our own, so that we can raise taxes from the property that we have within our school district boundaries. We will elect our own officials and all of that. Alma Heights, right? San Antonio School District calls up to Alma Heights, and Alma Heights says the same thing. They say, "What are you worth?" Right? And Alma Heights says, "No, thank you." Right? And Alma Heights goes, goes its own way. They go on their own. Today, Edgewood School District is one of the poorest school districts in the entire country. They're the only school district that was able to get an education financing, financing case to the Supreme Court because they are so poor. Right? And they struggle to this day. Right? This is the institutionalization of that landscape because this is where our kids go to school this is our social mobility as far as how successful we are. What opportunities are we prepared for? And we get stuck in this, right? When we buy a house, the first thing somebody does is they ask you, how many kids do you have? Right? And then they try to, and then they try to direct you into different school districts. Right? So what have we done? By the 1950s, we created a highly differentiated social geography through deed restrictions, through redlining, through the schools themselves. 
under incredibly exploitative and racist circumstances and processes. And then it was the 1960s, and we got enlightened. And we decided no more of that, right? No more. We're not doing that anymore. Yay us, right? So we brought equality. Yay. We brought equality, civil rights to this landscape, right? We brought global standards. Everybody gets to be treated the same now. Fabulous. Love that. Everybody gets to be treated equally, equal rights. We brought global standards and applied them on top of that landscape. What do I mean? Let's treat every child the same, right? That's a standardized curriculum. So that looks like, well, first it looks like Brown versus Board, but then it looks like our Robin Hood, and then Teeks, Tax, Tass, Tax, and Star. I just remember those from my kids. I, don't, I think they go older. But, um, but so let's, we're going to fund them all the same, right? Every, every child gets the same amount of money, and every child gets the same curriculum taught in the same way. Number two, public investment, rough proportionality. And I should reverse those because we have 10 equally populated city council districts, EA equality, right? And we divide the city budget by 10 and then, and then divvy it out. Everybody gets the same. Fabulous. But what happens when I do that on top of a landscape that I already created that I didn't throw away, like old shoes, um, that was, but it was created in, uh, that in, to be incredibly unequal, right? What happens? What happens? The cumulative effect of that, of our enlightenment, is, is the maintenance of the status quo, right? Everybody now just stays, stays in place. Um, and, it's this, and, and this now is where the city conversation is about inequity. Because yes, we're treating people equal, but we're starting in a very, very different place. So and that's what, we're, what we refer to as inequity. Right? It, equality and equity are very different. Equity is about needs. Right? So when we can still see this in the landscape. So those old areas, I think, yeah, where the old red and yellow lines are, still poor. Surprise, surprise, right? Yeah, everybody's treated the same, but they've remained poor. We haven't been able to alleviate this. This, and I'll just talk about this really quick, is that this is today housing values. Housing values west side in an area where you can find red, yellow, blue, and green lines, right? In the red, those are little pieces of property, and it's looking at how their, how their value is going up, right? Because our house is our savings account. That's where I save my money. It's silly to put it into a real savings account. You put it into your house, and then you plan on selling your house someday. In the, in the old red-lined areas, the brown means those, area, those houses are appreciating two and a half standard deviations below the rate that the rest of the county is appreciating. That's what the brown signals. The blue signals that those houses are appreciating at two and a half standard deviations above the rest of the county. Right? So, the, so when they were, blue, they were deed restricted, then they were redlined and greenlined. Today, they're appreciating at this wonderful rate. So people are, are generating wealth through their, through their home ownership. In the old redlined areas, we're slipping backwards, right? They're still losing. Today, right, phase four, current phase, reinvestment. We're reinvesting. We discovered this, right? San Antonio says, hey, our downtown is not where it should be. And we, so we, we, we formed this thing, and it's called the ICRIP, the Inner City Reinvestment Infill Policy, formed in the late 2000s. And it was intended to promote growth, target, targeted in the inner city, because our downtown was, was deteriorating. People didn't go there, right, in, in the 2000s and before. And so, so the city came up with this policy, which at the time was brilliant. Let's, let's, let's waive a lot of those big fees and encourage, incent, new development downtown, right? This, that, that, that area is exactly the area that had been redlined and yellow lines, right? So this, so, and so this is what's happening. This is in Mankey Park, old fourplex, right? It would be affordable to, mo to, to a working class family. Somebody making minimum wage working for the city. And maybe making a living wage, actually, working for the city. 
old fourplexes. They rented for like eight, nine hundred dollars Menke Park, great location, yay, we love that. These are, these are all being torn down through this incentive policies. And these are being built, and these are worth five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. So this means that we're losing a lot of our affordable housing stock, and we're replacing it with very expensive housing. And this is what's happening in some of those old areas that had been neglected investment for so long. Um, just looking at some recent data, this is mortgage data, right? This is available through the federal government, and it's mortgage data. And the dots signify how many mortgages, and in any form, for a new house, for a rehab, for anything, were made in that census tract, in that little neighborhood, in 2014. Look at the size of the dots in the red areas, the blue areas, and the newer areas compared to the red and the red and the yellow areas. You see what I mean? Little tiny dots. We've got a big dot in Southtown, yes. But th what that means is how much how much mortgage money, investment money, capital is flowing into our old neighborhoods relative to our new neighborhoods? Very, very little. Still to this day. The rate of denial of a mortgage for the inner city neighborhoods is very, very high compared to our other areas. There is, if I look at all of the mortgages made in Bear County in 2016, you can see where they are, right? They're still to the north. Our inner city neighborhoods, teeny tiny dots, right? That means that's investment. That's not just me spending money out of my pocket. That's real investment. Can I buy a house? Can I, can I fix up a house? Um, and finally, and I wish that this was blown in, but I wanted you to see the scale. This is the West Side Creeks Restoration Project. Yes, we're finally fixing up those creeks that the, that the Army Corps of Engineers concreted in, right? San Pedro Creek, it's going to be fantastically beautiful. Um, the sound, it's, they're going to look like the, like the San Antonio River. But that's the map for the, the West Side Creeks Restoration Projects. These are public projects, county and city, um, and some bonds, some other kinds of money. Uh, but what's, gonna, what's happening right along those right now is this, right? The Soapworks is, a, is, is an apartment complex right downtown, right along, right along the San Pedro Creek. And there's the creek project right there. That's what it looks like when you look through the fence. It's going to be so pretty. But this apartment complex is right on the banks of the San Pedro Creek. Right now, it's been there for a very long time. It was an old soap factory. Uh, right now, it is a little bit run down. It is. But it houses people who are making below a living wage. A lot of people on fixed income. A new, a new management company has bought it from Houston, and the rents have gone up over $100 in a, in a month. And people are scared. And they're holding co community meetings, and they're scared because they don't know where they're going to go. So, th so these are some of our, this is our reinvestment. Right? So we're not necessarily reinvesting in those old areas that were, that were denied investment since the beginning of the 20th century. Instead, we're reinvesting in these kinds of things that are not necessarily benefiting those who lost out in the beginning. There's the Soapworks Apartments today. So for the past 50 years, 78207 has been defined by poverty, inequality, and a sheer lack of opportunity. And pardon my language, but the, I just, you know, I just kind of, I get all caught up in this. When you, when you see that the next time, just go, well, no shit, right? We did that. We built that. That was intentional. That was a labor reserve, right? We built that intentionally so people wouldn't get ahead. Of course, they're, of course it's still poor. We've never invested. We didn't allow them to invest because we didn't allow them to borrow against their house or get a mortgage or fix it up, right? So this is the, this is the story that the city is involved with right now. When you read, when you read they, they use the term the equity lens. And it really is. And, you know, we built a landscape that was highly uneven. Right? And, and then we brought equality to it. But it just maintained the status quo. And so now we're having conversations. We'll see how we do. These are brand new conversations about what does equity mean? Well, equity looks at, at, at the needs, the needs that are in these different areas, and says this, we need to, we need to, to respond to, to equity, to, to needs, not just spread it out all around equally. Right? So, 
So really to close, I don't know who said this, but there's nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of unequal people. And that's what we've been doing. We've created inequality, and then we, and then we decided to treat everybody the same. And look where we are, right? We have, we're, we're, we are, we've been now like tagged as the most segregated city in the country. And well, when you look at the roots of it, that was very intentional, and we haven't done a lot to get out of it, right? So just to close, my question is, you know, if we don't start moving on it and thinking about it, what happens? Will our city grow? Or just for some of us, right? Just for the charmed few, those of us for whom it works. And, and, and you know, and maybe we'll just move farther away. If we, we can move to the edge, and then it's not our problem. So thank you for your time. I know that Anne had questions.